and Cindy Parlo Cohn and CEO JT Batson. Uh, before we open up with some opening comments from all three, just a quick reminder that if you want to ask a question, please raise your virtual hand. We'll do our best to get to everyone over the next 30 to 45 minutes. I'll now turn it over to Cindy for opening comments. Thanks, Neil. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us. I am so happy to introduce U.S. Soccer's next sporting director, Matt Crocker. As you all know, he brings a wealth of knowledge, um, having worked at various roles and at various levels of our game. He will set the sporting vision for U.S. Soccer and implement the technical plan for the women's, men's, extended, and youth national teams. His impressive resume speaks for itself, and I know some of you that are joining us today have already written about his great resume. <laughs> um, Matt has great experience in developing talent, implementing a clear and consistent playing philosophy from youth to senior teams, and implementing coaching programming. So after spending some time with Matt, it quickly became clear that he excels in communication as well as being a team builder. He is driven, he's creative, um, and committed to building relationships at every level of the game. His passion for the game, his experience, and expertise will make U.S. soccer better. We look forward to working with Matt and achieving great things together. Over to you, JT. Thank you, Cindy. We're incredibly excited for Matt to join us. Matt will officially begin his role on August 2nd, but in agreement with Southampton, he will be able to immediately focus on two areas. First, he will support our women's national team as they prepare for this summer's World Cup. Second, he will lead the process of hiring the next U.S. men's national team head coach. Matt has already spoken with Kate Margraff, Anthony Hudson, and Stuart Sharp, who oversees our extended national teams. He plans to meet with Blackco and the broader sporting department team in the coming days and weeks. Matt's experience and expertise will be a tremendous asset to all of us at U.S. Soccer, and his appointment will benefit the entire soccer ecosystem. And as a fan, I couldn't be more excited for the future of our national team programs. Welcome, Matt. Thanks, both. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm really honored and excited uh, to join uh, U.S. Soccer as a sporting director. Uh, it's a tremendous opportunity, and I'm really, really looking forward to building on the great work and the foundations that have already been laid um, uh, and uh, yeah, working with the staff, um, you know, in, a, in what is a really exciting opportunity. Um, as JT mentioned, the immediate focus is going to be around uh, supporting where I can the women's, uh, women's World Cup team uh, as they get ready for, for Australia and New Zealand. Um, and I'm really conscious that um, uh, I, I guess I work really closely with, uh, with Kate and the staff in the build up to that. Um, obviously, the Senior Men's World Cup um, is around the corner, um, and to have the opportunity from the beginning of the role to uh, to lead the search for the next men's head coach is a, is a significant honour and something I'm really excited about. Um, I'm also excited about working with the whole of the, the US soccer ecosystem, uh, coaches, the community, uh, all the various professional leagues, etc. So um, I just can't wait to get started um, and to kick off as soon as I possibly can. Great. All right. Thank you, Cindy, JT, and Matt. We're going to jump into questions. Uh, the first three will be from Doug McIntyre, then we'll go to Paul Tenorio, and then Henry Bushnell. Thanks, Neil. Thanks, guys. I uh, appreciate you doing this. Matt, welcome. Um, question for Cindy or JT, and then one for Matt. Cindy or JT, just if you could take us through the process, how many candidates did you interview, uh, and how important uh, was it, if at all, to hire someone from outside the uh, American soccer landscape. And for Matt, just jumping straight to the, the coaching search, do you have a timeline? Is it possible the hires made before you officially start on August 2nd? Um, and does the nationality of the coach matter? Would you prefer to have an American or someone that's uh, has experience coaching in the U.S., or does that not matter to you at all? Thank you very much. You sure you don't want to throw more questions? Yeah. <laughs> <in there? laughs> JT, you want to kick it off? Oh, thanks. The uh, So, you know, at the very start, um, when actually we were uh, joking about this this morning when, you know, Ernie called and, and let us know that he was planning to return home to uh, uh, to the Netherlands. Uh, you know, we knew that uh, 
this had to be a very broad based search, a global search and one where uh, we uh, ensured that we had the most diverse talent pool from the get go. And so uh, that's one of the main reasons why we partnered with a search firm to help us do that. So we started with a, a list that had dozens of names on it uh, and whittled that down uh, uh, and ultimately unanimously uh, uh, put forth uh, Matt uh, as our candidate and we're excited to introduce him today. Um, I don't know if there are other questions for us or whether that it was all to Matt. All to Matt. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the most important thing, uh, clearly, we want to get a head coach and the right head coach um, to lead the program in place as soon as possible. Um, but what we don't want to do is to, to rush and, and make the wrong appointment. Um, and there's a, a, a couple of key factors that I, I believe are going to be really important going forward. So um, first of all, the, the behaviors of the coach in terms of uh, I guess what what I see uh, from the current team is a uh, an aggressive, a forward thinking, a fearless team that went to the World Cup and and did some great stuff. And I'm really really keen to make sure that we uh, produce a coach that can uh, replicate and continue to drive forward some of those some of those behaviours in terms of creating that aggressive forward thinking team. Um, secondly, the style of play is going to be really important. Uh, clearly, there's there's a, uh, been some great foundations put in place by Greg and, and by Anthony around the style of play, and we want to continue to evolve that style of play. So to bring a coach in that can deliver that is, is also going to be uh, fundamental to the process. The third, and, and for me, the most important thing is around leadership. We need the right leader. Um, we need the right uh, head coach to come in and give the players ownership and responsibility to build a really, really strong culture or to continue to develop that really, really strong culture. And coaching internationally um, is very, very different to working every day uh, on the field uh, with, a, with a team, a club team. And some of the unique skill sets around uh, being able to contribute to other things, supporting players when they're in their clubs, building those strong club relationships, MLS relationships, et cetera, making sure things like uh, co collaboration and cooperation around player release are going to be a fundamental part of the role going forward as well. Um, so, you know, they are the most important factors, irrespective of where somebody is born, and we need to make sure that uh, that we put those at the forefront. Clearly, there's some significant advantages around building emotional connections with the players. You know, we, we clearly want a head coach that is a role model and a cultural leader uh, as well and can inspire the next generation. So the legacy piece around the future is as important, if not more important, than build up uh, to the next World Cup. Great. All right. Thanks for those eight questions, Doug. We'll move on <laughs> to the next group of questions. Paul Tenorio, you are up next. Thanks. Um, just to follow up on one of Doug's questions for JT and Cindy, um, if you could clarify how, how you whittled that list down, how many people actually reached the interview stage with you guys before you made the decision to go with Matt? And then um, kind of two questions for you, Matt, to follow up. There's six weeks away here from a Nations League, about eight weeks away from the start of the Gold Cup. Um, unique opportunity for a coach, a new coach to potentially be with two different pools of players for a, a good amount of time. Is the goal to have somebody in in time to get that that time with the team um, to be able to kickstart? And then for you also, why U.S. soccer? Um, we've heard there might have been interest in you from other Premier League teams as well after you announced to leave Southampton. What was it about this job that that intrigued you? Thank you. Start. You know, yeah, um, I mean, I think if I start with the, the exciting bit around uh, the role. So, you know, as I mentioned, it, it's an incredible honor to get the opportunity to sit here today. Um, my history with US soccer goes back a long way. So um, <laughs> I actually uh, had my first ever coaching experiences out in the, in the US um, based out of, uh, first of all, uh, Little Rock in Arkansas, when I came over for a few summers. Uh, and then said that with a southern accent. Yeah, I was going to say the accent. No, no. Yeah. And then um, leading on from that, um, had the opportunity to spend some time in in Kansas City uh, with the the Lewisburg Legends and the twelve <laughs> boys and then the twelve girls team. I'm sure Melissa Murphy and uh, Laurie Ewalt, who were my two captains at the time, will hopefully be watching and probably really surprised to see my <laughs> ugly face on the screen. But um, you know, my history goes back quite a long way. And, you know, to, to then be contacted and have the opportunity to come and, and interview for the role, 
I just wanted to make sure that I put my uh, my best self forward, uh, shared my experiences. I also know that there's some fantastic work that's going on in the men's uh, senior team, the women's senior team, the extended national youth, uh, the extended national teams, and obviously the youth programs, both on the boys and the girls side. So, you know, to have the opportunity to step in and build on those foundations and be part of that and listen and learn in the early months to understand the landscape is, is something that is really exciting. And then obviously you've got uh, the amazing tournaments that are, that are around the corner, you know, the men's World Cup, the Olympics, uh, hopefully fingers crossed the, the Women's World Cup as well. So, you know, I, I'm really excited about uh, being able to play a, a small part in, in that in the coming years to come. Uh, but the real thing for me is around this legacy piece. So, you know, to to try and support U.S. soccer becoming the number one sport in the U.S. is is something that um, is a, a huge opportunity and something that I'm really, really excited about. Yeah, and I'll chime in on the process. So um, we whittled the list down to, I believe, 10. Um, and we had various levels of conversations with those 10. Um, and then move forward with formal interview process with, I believe, seven yeah. candidates. Okay, great. Uh, before we get to Henry, the next three will be Kana, uh, Kyle Bonagura, Jonathan Tannenwald, and Ron Blum. Uh, Henry, you should be up next. Thanks, Neil. And uh, start with the plan. apologies in advance if there's any or Wi-Fi issues. Um, well, for Matt, just you mentioned your history there. Uh, um, since then, more recently, um, while you were working in England, um, how much did you stay in touch with the the U.S. landscape? Maybe not necessarily in communication, but just you know, you know, understanding what what, what was going on here, the changes in the youth landscape, um, and or like how much how much catching up do you feel like you have to do, given that the way, especially youth soccer, is done here is a lot different than in a lot of other countries yeah sure um thanks for the question and um yeah i mean you know my priorities in the past couple of seasons has been uh in england working um, in the premier league but obviously working also across both uh, the men's and the women's team and the youth programs at southampton so you know first and foremost my focus has been on that um however however as i as i mentioned uh, the U.S. Is, has always been a, a passion of mine, um, and I've always followed the soccer. Um, so, you know, to see the developments in the MLS, uh, to see the obviously the new teams coming into the franchise, the development of Stadia, um, you know, the uh, the MLS Next uh, programs, the academy development. You know, I, I've I've seen that uh, from a distance. Um, I've also been close enough firsthand to uh, when I worked at uh, the English FA to play. Across the, the both the boys and the girls side with the U.S. national teams, and to see the development. So, in particular, that 2000 age group that we played in the World Cup uh, and the 17 level. You know, some outstanding talent, that, and and obviously many of those players have now gone on to uh, to make that jump through into the seniors. So, you know, I've watched it from afar. Um, clearly, I've I've got a lot to learn both in the men's and the and the women's game. Um, but to have the opportunity already to hit the ground running, I've already met Kate. Um, and I'm you know, expecting to do the same very soon with Vladko. So uh, I had some time yesterday with, with Stuart from the extended national team. So, uh, yeah, I'm really excited, but I'm under no illusions of what I need to learn and I need to learn quickly. But the joy is there's some great people already in U.S. soccer with those experiences that I can tap into from day one. Great. All right, we'll move on to Kyle. Yeah, Matt, I'm curious what you feel like the changing perception has been of of the way the U.S. men's team plays in Europe and kind of just what the, you know, how people view, view the team, where you're from and how that's evolved over the years. And then just on top of that, wh where do you plan on being based? Is it going to be in Chicago or somewhere else? Thanks. Yeah. So I'll deal with the second one. So yeah, I'll be, I'll be based in Chicago. So, um, you know, frantically trying to find somewhere to, to I already sent him some recommendations from yeah. having just gone through that search. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so that, you know, that's the, that's a key priority as well to, to get settled as quickly as I possibly can, um, to enable me to focus 100% of my time, uh, on the job. And what was the first part of the question again? Sorry. Perception of the U S. Oh yeah. 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 From, from Europe. Yeah, sure. So um, I think what you see now is clearly a very young, dynamic team. So, you know, being the second youngest team in the World Cup, 
um, you know, and to be able to give 25 out of the 26 players World Cup experience, because obviously uh, 25 of those players uh, hadn't played any World Cup experience before. Um, you know, some of the when you when you look and analyze some of the goals that were scored. So, you know, you consider the goal against Wales. The team has got the ability to uh, to counter attack really fast. So the ball's eight seconds with the Welsh keeper, and then eight seconds later, you know, we is making the run from outside to in to uh, to you know to score a fantastic goal. So you know the team are capable of, of being a really front-footed, dynamic, fast attacking team. But what you also saw is moments where the team are comfortable in you know maintaining momentum in the game and controlling possession. Uh, you know, those moments against England where they took the sting out of the game and were able to, to control the play for at least a minute and over a minute with, with really good possession. So you've got players who are comfortable and confident at being able to technically manage the ball. So, you know, straight away, you can now see a dynamic forward thinking team, but also a team that has got the ability technically to, to deal with, uh, with those pressure moments. And hopefully now leading into 2026, the team have had some great experiences and psychologically we'll be better prepared going into 2026. So, you know, we are going to be a nation that is going to be feared and, uh, you know, a nation that wants to move forward into a, a home tournament that we can really attack. And obviously the, the fans, the community have got a great part to play in being our 12th player behind the scenes. Uh, to have the opportunity to do that on home soil is, uh, is really, really exciting. Great. We will move on to Jonathan Tannewald. Thanks, Neil. Hi, everybody. Jonathan Tannewald from the Philadelphia Inquirer here. I think both of these questions are for Matt. The first one is that on the men's side of things, multinational player recruiting is a key piece of the operations. Do you intend to take the lead on that or delegate it to somebody else? And if the latter, will that person be a new hire? And on the women's side, um, you know, the U.S. team's success that you mentioned watching from afar at the F.A., it inspired a lot of people as in England, as we all know, and that culminated in some ways with the women's Euros title. Um, as you watched the England women's team develop into a team that won the Euros, what out of that and what it took do you think you can bring back and translate into U.S. soccer? Thanks. Yeah, no problem. It's really difficult dealing with these multiple questions, by the way. But I'll, I can I'll do my best. I'll too. do my best. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the dual nationality is a is a key part of. Um, uh, of, of international soccer now and uh, you know we are in such a diverse country and we have such a unique opportunity to make sure that we uh, we tap into that as a as a significant resource so you know first of all I need to understand what we've already got in place uh, from those processes because I know Anthony in particular uh, has done a great job on that side um, with some with some key work recently with some players so you know again to have the opportunity to follow up with Anthony again and and, and to build on that uh, for sure, it's going to be a key part of um, of our program going forward. And uh, yeah, we want to make sure that we we tap into that as much as we possibly can. Um, inter the international landscape has almost become like a club environment where there is an opportunity to uh, to sell a pathway uh, to a player and to really build those emotional connections with the country. And uh, you know, we're really really determined behind the scenes to to grow that and to continue to develop that. Um, and then on the women's side, um, you know, it was a it was a huge honour to be part of uh, the 2013 when I joined uh, the English FA um, to look at, across the men's and the women's side um, to to look to build a DNA and a and a style of play and a culture uh, around the whole national programmes and to and to be a small cog in the wheel that enabled um, us to be more successful in the future at that moment in time. Um, and seeing the success and the development and the growth of the uh, of the women's game in England, um, you know, has it, just been exciting to watch. And, uh, you know, I guess, you know, 12 out of the last 13 years, the US women's national team has had an unbelievable record of being, you know, the number one team, uh, number one FIFA ranked team in the world. But that gap is getting closed all the time. There's more professional leagues across Europe and the world now. Uh, there's more, uh, I guess the players are fitter and stronger because they get to train every day in a professional environment. They're more tactically aware um, because they get the time to work and obviously they're, they're technically better players. So, you know, that gulf of, of the chasing pack is, uh, you know, is right on our heels. And uh, it's really, really important that I work with Kate and Vladko and the, all of the staff to make sure that we continue to identify what our competitive advantages are, and we continue to focus on those things to, to keep us ahead of those chasing packs. One uh, 
to add on to the, the first question, one of the things that, that excited, uh, many things that excited me in, in the process around that, but as we uh, think about dual nationals, making sure we're thinking about dual nationals, uh, not just for our men's program, but our women's program and our extended national teams. Uh, we have a, a full recruiting effort across the board that, that we want to be great at. Uh, we've made a lot of great progress on that. And, and that's something that as, as more and more people are playing soccer and, and, and obviously, you know, Matt mentioned how diverse we are as a country. We want to make sure that we are the place where where people see their their pathway to to develop as elite soccer players, and and we want to be able to do that across the board, which we're we're excited about. Great. We're going to move to Ron Blum next, but before we get to you, Ron, the following three will be Alexi Lalas, Andrew Jones, and Mike Waitala. Ron, you're up. Okay. Hey, Matt. Uh, you mentioned some of the accomplishments of uh, the U.S. team at the World Cup. Do you think uh, Burhalter deserves to be considered for another chance, or are you more leaning toward the need for a new break? And a few months ago, when you interviewed Jesse Marsh for Southampton, what were the things that intrigued you, and why ultimately did you decide to go in a different direction? Yeah, look, I mean, it's, you know, it's it's really difficult to be able to to give you some definitive answers right now. I think what we're doing is, as I mentioned, working to make sure that we've got the right process to make sure that we can make the right hire as quickly as we we possibly can. And uh, I'm really working closely with Cindy and JT to, uh, to, to speed that up and to make sure that the process is in place. Uh, as I mentioned, my biggest focus right now is not thinking about any individuals. It's about thinking about the behaviors that we need the style of play that we want to promote going forward, the type of leader that we want to bring in, and then obviously that legacy piece that we uh, that, that we want to instill and have the opportunity to grow into 2026. Um, it would be unprofessional of me right now to talk about individual names. I mean, Greg has done a, a fantastic job, and uh, you know, I intend to to follow up with a number of of candidates, um, both internally within the organisation and externally, to to begin to understand more and to, to assist my learning as well. And uh, you know, I'll be doing that as quickly as I possibly can. Great, and we're going to move to Alexi, who is going to get us back on track with one question. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, I'll try. Uh, welcome and congratulations, Matt. Um, so I, I recognize and respect your answer may change as you get, uh, you know, as you continue on here, uh, and more importantly, are in the you know the belly of the beast, as it were. Uh, but I'm assuming that your mandate is to improve on the good and change the bad here. So relative to that. Um, also, in your interview process, I'm sure you were asked, uh, even from afar, what that good and bad was. Can you give us two specific examples of the program that you saw, I get it, from afar, of what is good and what is bad? I'm not talking about the U.S. Women, Women in the World Cup. That's that's too big, but as specific and detailed as you can get. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, you know, clearly, uh, if I focus on the good, um, you know, first of all, the most important thing, that, and, and my passion uh, is is player development so you know to have the opportunity to to come on board and to help support what is already in place in terms of a player pathway so making sure that we've got a clear identity um, of how we want our teams to look on the field to make sure that we've got a strong culture off the field um, in terms of the type of you know young men and young women that we want to uh, we want to help grow and develop within our system um, you know, is is fundamentally really important. So, you know, to have the opportunity to contribute to a an aligned pathway that sees, you know, pro players progressing from our 15s all the way through our system into the into the seniors, um, is something that I see some great work going on already. But also, um, you know, I'd like to think I've got some some experiences uh, that that might be able to help um, support you know, some of the great work already in place. Um, and, you know, it's really, really difficult for me to pinpoint right now what maybe where some of the challenging areas are. Um, but what I do know already through my conversations with Kate yesterday with Stuart is I do think there's some, uh, I guess I'd call them low hanging fruit, some real opportunities for us to uh, to develop and push some stuff forward. But again, you know, I'm really keen to make sure I don't dive in um, and think I've got all the answers. It's never a lift and shift when you come from one organization or or one association into another. Um, for me, I really need to spend some time understanding context from some of the brilliant people in the organization. And I'll be doing that as quickly as I possibly can. 
Great, we'll move to Andrew. Thank you, Neil. Congratulations, Matt, on this whole day. And congratulations to Sydney and JC on this process um, leading towards this. Um, you talked about in terms of the collaborative nature that you have seen from U.S. soccer, from Sydney's leadership to um, JC. Uh, what were some of the things that impressed you most in terms of the collaborative nature that you saw that was under Ernie with Kate and Brian McBride? And um, if there will be any time frame for you in terms of a new general manager for the men's team after um, Brian O'Brien um, is a little departure. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the multiple questions again. My brain is <laughs> okay. um, Yeah, I mean, uh, look, what excited me? So, you know, having the opportunity to go through the process with Cindy and JT, um, I guess what I saw is, um, I, I guess, a lot of excitement. So, you know, to, the ability to break you know, barriers down, to break traditions down, to move the game forward, uh, to take on this new challenge. You know, the, the word that kept uh, being spoken about was legacy, you know, the opportunity with the key tournaments that we've got coming up and the great programs that we've already got in place to, to continue to grow, uh, you know, U.S. soccer from a grassroots level, but also through into, um, uh, into the senior professional game. So, you know, two guys who who gave you know some real passionate speeches to me around the opportunities and the things that we're going to go after. So for me, they were the things that that most excited me um, and got me sort of hooked in. Um, and then for me, it was just about could I show that level of excitement and experience back to be the best candidate, which is which is what I've tried to do. And I'm fortunate enough to be sit, sat here right now. And again, what was the second question? Apologies. Uh, GM for the men's team. Yeah. Again, it's. Again, without context, without being in the environment, without listening and learning from uh, from the key staff, it's very, very difficult for me on day one to say, yes, we need a general manager. And when that will happen, you know, I, I want to really listen and learn. So, you know, I'm going to I'm going to take some time first to make sure that we get the right structure uh, in place. And, uh, and I'm looking forward to doing that with the staff as quickly as I possibly can. Great. Uh, Mike, you're up next. Before or after we get to you, Mike, we're going to go to Jeff Kasuf, Kyle Bond, and Charlie Bohm. Hi, Matt. <clears throat> the, um, the the U.S. population under the age of 18 is about 26% Latino, and in recent years, on the men's side, the youth national team rosters have been about anywhere from 25 to up to 40% Latino. How, how familiar are you with Latin American soccer? Uh, what is your opinion about the Latin style of soccer and, and how does that demographic impact you as you uh, set the sporting vision for U.S. soccer? Thank you. Yeah, sure. I mean, as I, as I mentioned, you know, there's a lot of things about U.S. soccer um, that I need to learn and I need to understand. And, and that would be one of the significant landscapes. landscapes. Um, you've given me a statistic that I, that I hadn't, uh, I hadn't researched yet. So, you know, as I mentioned, I've got, a, I've got a, a great amount to learn in a, in a short space of time, and I'll be doing all I can behind the scenes to, uh, to pick that up. But as I mentioned, you know, what I want to make sure that we've got is real diversity across our teams. It's about um, you know the best players being picked for the for the best teams at the at the right moments in time. And what we want to do is to make sure the most important part is the pathway. So we want to make sure our selection process is right at the very very youngest ages to make sure that the players can grow and develop with us. Um, and I'll be doing all I can behind the scenes with the staff to uh, to support that process. Great. We'll move on to Jeff Kasuf. Uh, thanks for taking the time, uh, Matt. I'm wondering on the, um, you know, on the women's side specifically, there's more in place, right? There's there's a GM, a coach, a World Cup around the corner, uh, versus the men's side where you have hires to make. Um, as how, how do you envision sort of balancing bringing new ideas and and maybe implementing those to a program that's been winning and has sort of a really defined DNA and and has for a long time and and just maybe as you do that or just as you work with them. Um, you know, how do you do you think you can apply approaches sort of universally to the men's and women's side? Or do these programs maybe with different histories and at different points, you know, need separate approaches in some way? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's a great question. I think there's definitely similarities. And, you know, already, you know, to be able to be in Chicago where, you know, the men's teams, the women's teams, the youth teams, and also the extended national teams are all rubbing shoulders, coaches sharing ideas. You know, there's a huge, huge opportunity for collaboration and 
I already see that happening. And, uh, you know, speaking to, to Kate yesterday and Stuart, you know, those things are, are already taking place. So, you know, we're in a really strong position to start from. Um, in terms of the, the women national teams and success, yeah, there's also, there's differences in the program. So, you know, you've got, uh, you've got a, a team that is world's best and has been world's best for 12 out of the last 13 years. And then you've got a, a men's team that is a young, dynamic, forward-thinking team that is uh, that has achieved some success in the last World Cup, and we want to build on that. So the programs are in in very very different places from from some perspective. So you know there will be some some slight differences and and some competitive advantages from the men's and the women's game that we need to to separate and, and go after. Um, but again, as I as I mentioned. You know, for me, it, it would be it'd be wrong and silly of me to come in and think that I've got all the answers. I haven't. Um, but what I know I've already got in place is some some great staff who uh, and also a women's program that, like I mentioned, has been world's number one. And uh, what I want to make sure that I do is to continue to challenge and support that program. Uh, but for me to do that, I need to, first of all, get in. Uh, spend some time with uh, the staff, spend some time with the team, spend some time in and around the environment, listen and learn. And then hopefully when there's the right opportunities, uh, hopefully add those little bits of value that um, hopefully I've gained through my experiences of, of 25 years in, uh, in professional soccer. Great. Up next, Kyle. Thank you guys. And hi, Matt, congrats on, on the role and appreciate your Thank time you. today. Um, you, you made mention of this briefly earlier in the call, having worked across both national team and club levels in the past, now looking to hire the coach on the men's side. In your experience across both, what are some coaching qualities that you've found can play well specifically on the national team level as opposed to the everyday club level? Yeah, I mean, I think I touched uh, earlier on on, um, on leadership. So um, you know, when you are in a club environment, you have the opportunity to work on the grass uh, or on the on the on the field every day um, with the uh, with the players. And uh, in international football and, and the national team program doesn't give you an opportunity to do that. Um, so, you know, your leadership skills and being able to have uh, or build really really strong relationships with players is absolutely fundamental. What you can't be doing every time you have a new camp is to spend three or four days recapping and and getting back up to speed. So you know to have a, a head coach and a, a and a coaching team that will support players uh, in their own club environments and can build those strong relationships with the players with the clubs uh, is fundamentally a really really important part uh, of the role. Um, and you know as I mentioned also. You know, to be able to view the game slightly different, you know, you need to be an unbelievable planner, uh, international level, because the games come thick and fast. And if you aren't planned and prepared, which takes weeks and months in advance, and that's team operations, the type of environment that you want to go to, the type of hotel, all of those things when you're away for a long, long period of time play a significant part of whether you can be successful or not. So it's not just about the tactics and preparing the team. There's so much work that goes behind the team, uh, behind the scenes from an ops and an admin point of view, from a, a performance point of view, a psychology point of view. And all of those things need to be coordinated uh, you know, by the general managers and the head coaches to make sure that uh, everybody is aligned to a single vision and, and you know, a single strategy of what we're going after in tournaments. So it is a very, very different and a very, very unique skill set. And, uh, you know, it would be it would be remiss just to go for a coach who was a tactical genius because you don't always get that time every day or you don't get that time every day. And the impact you need to have sometimes is when the players aren't with you and how much time you invest in the care and the attention and the relationships with players and staff is critical to the success, in my humble opinion. Great. We're going to move to Charlie Bohm, and we have three after that, um, and we'll probably end with those three. We've got Joseph Lowry, uh, Adam Bells, and Donald Wine. Charlie, you're up. Thanks. Uh, my question is for CPC and, and JT. Uh, I wondered if you could speak to the diversity and representation aspect of this hiring process, um, where that factored in, and maybe what that pool of finalists look like in those sense. Yeah, I can talk to that. I don't have the numbers in front of me, um, but I can tell you when we got down to the final three candidates, um, two were diverse candidates, and then obviously Matt as well. 
And JT, do you feel that that's uh, that that your expectations or maybe the culture you want was was reflected in that process? And the, you know, as as, as we mentioned at the start, the uh, we were incredibly focused at the beginning of ensuring we had the uh, sort of widest possible pool of candidates uh, and uh, men, women uh, from all sorts of different backgrounds. Uh, nationalities and soccer backgrounds to make sure that we were approaching this in a in a way that uh, led us to the the best positive outcome. And uh, yeah, all through the process, uh, we're we're you know very intentional about that in each step. And I think as as Cindy Cindy mentioned, uh, you know we we had a diverse pool the entire time, and and uh, you know that's something that that I'm excited about and, and excited about what that means for the future of soccer in this country. I think the uh, one, the interest level from candidates all around the world was was exciting. Uh, two, the knowledge base about American soccer from candidates outside the United States was uh, was impressive and and was a sign of how far soccer has come on the global stage. Uh, American soccer, uh, and three, the diverse talent pool that that we saw at home uh, gives us uh, real excitement around what the future looks like for our ecosystem, and so. Uh, that's something that that we're all going to benefit from, uh, and and you know we're going to be able to to bring to life as we go forward. Great. All right, Joseph, you're up. Fantastic. Thank you all so much for taking time to do this, Matt. Congratulations on the new role for you, Matt. You. I'd love to drill down into some of the the tactical and stylistic elements that you mentioned earlier, right? For the the men's team, you mentioned wanting to build on the foundation that folks like Greg Berhalter set and established over the last few years. With regards to that next U.S. men's team manager, what tactical identity would you like to implement? How would you articulate that to, to us? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I think I used the word uh, fearless earlier on and, you know, a team that is prepared to, to walk towards the challenge. So, you know, to do that, you need to, to be confident. Um, so, you know, technically we need players who can be comfortable in uh, what I call managing momentum at international football because it is a momentum is a big part of it. You know, you you guys will watch games and you can see momentum shifting games all of the time. And you know, to have a team that is tactically intelligent and to know that when they're under pressure and have some methods of being able to uh, use the ball uh, through possession to be able to take the the sting out of the game is is critical at international level. Um, and that is it clearly comes from players individual um, abilities but but then also tactically how you set up the team uh, for them to be able to identify those things and I guess the key thing for for me is I want to make sure that we've got uh, we develop players who can identify and deliver those moments and not necessarily always have to look to the sidelines uh, for the coaches for that uh, so you know we're going to give the players a huge amount of ownership so you know, te te technically and tactically, we need to be able to play that style. But also when you talk about a fearless team and you talk about the second youngest team in the World Cup and we're a fast and aggressive team, you know, to have the ability to, at the right moments, to be able to play with real speed and real intensity is um, is a key part of the uh, of, of the team and the identity that, that Greg has helped to build. And, and obviously uh, Anthony is taking forward as well. So we want to grow and build on that because we've got some players with huge potential and huge levels of creativity to be able to identify and then deliver those, those key moments in games. But I also want to talk about without the ball. Um, and, you know, I think it's really important that um, again, when I talk about fearless, I'm thinking about players who are prepared or defenders who are prepared to be able to defend one V one and not need cover and balance all of the time that can be aggressive and but but really solid in, in defending and also you know players who are comfortable at defending high up the pitch and not always needing space or or always needing sort of uh, distances that are, are less because of uh, of the physicality of how quick the game is so you know we want to develop players who are comfortable at pressing high defensively and being really really aggressive so you know hopefully that just gives you a little flavor of you know, what I see in the team in terms of the potential. And then also one of the final things to touch on is, you know, I mentioned about the experiences that, that you know, the players got through that World Cup experience of, of playing arguably some of the best teams in the world, you know, your Englands and, and, your, and your Hollands then outside of the group stages. And, you know, the players are going to be so much more better prepared for the next time for that. And, you know, that, that 
to be able to now start to think about some of the competitive advantage stuff that we can do with the players around making sure that they are even more confident and prepared to deliver in those key moments. Uh, international football sometimes just ends up being box to box and you know to have the players who can deliver those key moments of, of scoring and, and preventing goals is going to be critical for our success going forward so there's a little bit on recruitment but there's also a massive bit around development within the team great we're going to move to adam matt i love how you keep talking about the legacy piece and i i uh so you mentioned the class of 2000 that you saw at the U17 World Cup in 2017. A lot of that talent came up through the Development Academy, the U.S. Soccer Development Academy, which is now um, no longer exists, right? And it's it's sort of defaulted over to the MLS next, a lot of high-level youth development. And I wonder, I know it's early, but I wonder, what's your first blush sort of assessment of how MLS next is doing and, you know, it, it, from a theoretical point of view, would you prefer something more like the Development Academy than MLS Next? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think, um, you know, I, I already see, as I mentioned earlier, the infrastructure that is being built across the MLS now, not not just necessarily stadia, but, you know, training and, and support facilities. And again, not just for the for the senior teams, uh, both on the men's and the women's side, but also for the for the youth and extended teams. Um, you know, the facility development in there is, is, is been significant. Uh, also, what I see is, you know, the MLS uh, in particular on the, on the boys' side, already you can see the development of, of coaches. So there's more full-time coaches going into those organizations now. Um, you know, coach education, there's more education coaches. There's a more diverse games program. You know, I'm already seeing MLS uh, youth academy teams playing coming over to the UK and playing as well so they go into more diverse tournaments across the world so you know all of those things both from a, a training perspective in terms of development of the program but also the games program opportunities that are getting in a much much more diverse field um, is going to stand the program in, in great stead going forward um, and I know you touched on that that uh, the 2000s group and you know it was a special group of players that have gone on but I already see more of those teams coming through uh, the youth systems here and you know as an association the size of the country you know the mls clubs in particular on the boys side are going to play a significant part in that development we need to rely on those and we work we need to work really really collaboratively and making sure the coach education is right the pathway opportunities are right and uh, you know i'm really looking forward to learning more and, and exploring ways that we can do that together because uh, it has to be collaboratively and joined up all right, our final question will go to Donald Wine. Thank you, Neil. And uh, Matt, Cindy, JT, thank you so much for your time. And Matt, apologies. We're part of team two-part question with this one, but I promise you the first one's quick. Um, as you know, the youth are in focus this year. You have the U20 World Cup next month before you officially begin full-time. How involved will you be with the team's preparations for that tournament? And my second question is on the extended national teams. There's been a lot of focus on those teams in recent years, uh, as more have become officially under the U.S. soccer umbrella, and Stuart Sharp has done a tremendous job in highlighting the efforts of those teams. But what's your plan to elevate awareness and support for those teams that don't get the TV slots and the enhanced visibility, but are just as successful as our senior teams? Yeah, thank you for saving the best questions for last. Um, uh, yeah, two, two things. First of all, um, obviously, the under 20s go to the World Cup, which is a, a fantastic tournament and a fantastic experience that those uh, those players are going to get. Uh, and again, context, you know, for me to come in and all of a sudden want to get, um, you know, get knee deep in the uh, in the detail, um, you know, is, is a challenge because, uh, again, understanding the context, I know that the work is already in place There's a brilliant plan for the team. You know, the, the the coaches, the infrastructure, the performance departments, they're all set up. The administration and the operation side is all ready to go. Um, so, yeah, of course, I'll be watching uh, watching from afar uh, and I'm going to take a really, really keen interest. And I'll definitely have some time with the coaches uh, before they go. And, you know, I'll be keen to know the detail of what the schedules look like and the technical plan, et cetera. Um, but, you know, that will just be from a learning perspective, uh, from my point of view. Um, but yeah, so it'll be a, um, the context and it'll be from a, from a distance, um, but I'm really excited to see what, what that team is capable of doing. And then the second part of the question in terms of the extended national teams, 
uh, to have the opportunity to sit with Stuart yesterday and we had a, we had an hour together to see his passion for the nine teams that are already under the banner, um, to see the um, excitement and the growth that he, where he wants to take the programme. I know, again, I've got a great amount to learn from Stuart um, and also the, the other guys that support that programme. Um, and again, you know, from my perspective, I want to make sure that I give as much time and as much support to Stuart, knowing and understanding the level of expertise he has got, but also the learnings that I've got to do. Um, you know, as I said to him yesterday, my job is to make sure that I support and challenge you and try and make sure that I give you everything that you need to continue to grow and expand your programs and provide great role models for um, for our children and adults with disabilities in the future. All right. Almost exactly 45 minutes. Thanks to Matt and JT and Cindy. Thanks for everyone for joining. Uh, we will have a transcription of this call on USsoccer.com later today. And as always, if you have any other additional questions, uh, do not hesitate to reach out to me directly. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.